speak of the devil, that they shall appear. We're not here because we're free. We're here because we're not free. There's no escaping reason, no denying purpose. Because as we both know, without purpose, we would not exist. Chief, mate, what do you want to do tonight? The same thing we do every night, Pinky. Try to take over the world. My God, it would be beautiful. This is the World Magic Movement. Tonight's episode, Mad Dog Eccentrics. Hello, this is Saul Ravencraft, and I am talking to S. Rob. Hello, hello S. Rob here. Hello, Saul. So, we have started a tradition now of being our shows with a ritual. Uh, every single one has been in a different direction. We have gone to hell. We have uh, transported. Uh, our, we, we've, we've broadcast our... Uh, shows into hell. Uh, we've made all sorts of unusual connections here, uh, invoked various kinds of energies. And when you told me what you wanted to do, I thought you were joking. But you no, this is no, this is hardcore. We are invoking the dead spirit of Benny Hill. <laughs> yep, and not just now, Benny Hill. I, uh, I grew yep. up, my dad watched Benny Hill. Uh, and I, uh, I sort of snuck looks at it. I wasn't supposed to be watching Benny Hill, uh, but uh, I would sneak uh, looks at it. And as I've gotten older, I've seen some of it. Uh, Benny Hill is harder to find than it used to be, not as easy to find as Monty Python. Uh, but Hill was uh, something else. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I can remember when there was a lot of comedians were complaining about Benny Hill. And basically, it was about it's very sexist and sexist. But actually, it's not because he never gets the girl. If you look at it, if you look at Benny Hill, the guys never get the girl. And most of the time, the women end up looking attractive and clever, and the guys look stupid. That's how it works. You know, it is, isn't it? You know, and at the end, he's running away from them. <laughs> Just, you yeah, know. no, absolutely. And I think that that's the sort of thing that people miss uh, when they look at some of these pieces of classic humor is that there were messages underneath it that were not what we think were. Uh, like you said, uh, he wasn't uh, he wasn't showing control and uh, and aggression. Uh, he was really showing the sort of stupidity of the man who thinks he can just reach out and grab a girl. Uh, the, the, that, that sort of person is really just an ass. Um, I think my favorite Benny Hill sketch, uh, though, was the uh, Wicking Well. Do you yeah, remember that one? one yeah. <laughs> uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, everybody listening, just go look up Benny Hill yeah. Wishing Well, and you'll probably find that clip somewhere. That one still makes me laugh. Yep. Yeah, but we're not just invoking Benny Hill, we're also drawing on George Formby. Now, people may not be uh, as familiar with him, but he actually was banned more times than anyone anywhere else in history. And basically, he was a comedian, and he played songs, like funny songs, and you had like a banjo or a banjolele normal or a normally, or a ukulele. And it, but he was so banned because at the time, the BBC would ban him multiple times in songs. Uh, and this actually peaked with him uh, uh, writing the song and singing the song uh, with me little stick of Blackpool Rock, which has got so much innuendo in it that it was his yeah, way of rebelling against the whole thing. But yeah, he's, he's still the most banned individual in history, which means you can go places that are incredibly intolerant, you know, where you basically couldn't do anything without breaking some sort of a rule. And yet there's no one there who has broken the rules as many times as George Formby. Which makes me, makes me proud, that it really does. Uh, and we're also invoking Edward Teach, who was Blackbeard the Pirate. Uh, and also, maybe lesser known to some people, a guy called W.E. Fairburn. Uh, a very interesting guy called William Ewitt Fairburn, that's his full name. Uh, and he actually formed the basis of all modern military combat. 
And it was one of those people, in some ways it's a familiar story. You know, he joined the military too young at 16 when he should have been 18. Uh, but then he went there serving the Shanghai Police Force, which was named as also the Shanghai Riot Squad. And he was almost killed, he was stabbed 16 times, but instead of dying like most other people would, he actually just got a lot tougher. And he learned all, yeah, he learned all different martial arts, but more interesting, he formed something completely new called Defendu. Uh, and the rest, and his whole body was covered with scars from knife attacks and things like this. And he trained his men in these unusual methods that were completely different at the time, you know. Uh, but that would have been enough for anybody. But then came World War II. You know, even if he wasn't a lucky man, we'll give, we'll give him that. He might not have been lucky because then there was World War II. And then Defendu became uh, the Get Tough Manual, which was a reduced version, which was, it took out the arrest techniques and stuff like that. And then, of course, after that, that was the inspiration for uh, the American kill or get killed. The guy who came up with that was trained uh, by W.E. Fairburn. And so basically all military combat all over the world, all the modern military styles, all came from this one guy. You know, so he was quite a guy, W.E. Fairburn, you know. And, of course, his books are well known now. Yeah. Well, he sticks out a little bit. The others seem to be music. Well, I guess Edward Beach. Now, he was, uh, that was Blackbeard is the way uh, we remember him, yes? Blackbeard the pirate. So, so a couple of, a tup, couple of uh, fighting men and uh, notorious fighting men and a couple of notorious comedians. That's right. I believe, and I do believe, there are certain sorts of comedy that don't really work with certain uh, intolerant or, you know, you know, negative belief systems. They just don't work. You know, if you like Benny Hill, there's certain other things that just don't work with it. You know, uh, it just doesn't fit. It's the same with George Formby. You know, if you like George Formby, a lot of sort of you know, intolerance, you couldn't have, you couldn't have George Formby, I don't think, wouldn't be a hit in a country where, you know, women couldn't drive or things like that, it just wouldn't be. So, you know, I feel it's, it's a positive influence. But yeah, the other two are very tough guys, you know. Edward Teach, Blackbeard of the Pirate, like you said, a notorious pirate. Uh, normally considered the most famous pirate in history. And of course, like I said, W. Fairburn, a really tough guy, you know. Uh, well, and he would he would go on board ships with burning match in his beard. Yeah. That's true, yeah. He would, he'd, yeah. But as, I'm also thinking as well that I can draw on uh, the image of these people because most of these, well, all of these people are well known at least to certain people. Everybody seems to know Benny Hill. You know, I, I think most people know George Formby and Blackbeard, but there's a lot of people know W.E. Fairburn, but you've got to be in that sort of thing. Most military guys will all know who he is. You know, if you went in the, U in the USA, like where you are, and you talk to any survivalist and you mention W.E. Fairburn, they'll all know who he is. <laughs> you know, so he, there is a lot of people. So he's got, there's a lot of draw on there as well. So we don't necessarily have to always summon the person themselves, the dead person. We can use their image as well to, to uh, you know, to, to fight against uh, the evil in the world. Sure. Sure. Well, that sounds fair enough to me. So we are going to invoke these people. And are they going to stay during the show? They're actually going to just do the ritual there. They will be there summoned, and then well, the command in the, is in the ritual, and then they'll leave to do their work. So they're just going to do the work this time. You know, but every time you play it, every time that ritual is played, you know, it will empower them, it will summon them, and basically do the same thing again. And if our guests are looking to invoke entities, to invoke people for their own works, is what you're going to show here a good example of how to do that? It is, yeah, because I'm opening gateways to heaven and hell. Because, you, frankly, you don't know where people are going to be if they're dead. You don't know. Opening both is a good way to go. So I'm opening both gateways, closing both gateways at the end, you know, summoning them. Yeah, it's a good way of working that, you know. It's a good practical method. All right. So take notes, people. That's right, yeah. We'll be asking questions. There will be exam papers. <laughs>
All right. Well, uh, uh, go ahead and uh, let's do the ritual. Yeah, let's start it now. And I'm going to summon four of the most eccentric Englishmen of all time and perhaps four of the best. Benny Hill, great comedian. George Formby, the most banned individual of all time anywhere in the world, who was also a comedian and a singer and a musician and an actor. Also, Edward Teach, he known as Blackbeard the Pirate. And W.E. Fairburn, also known as William, William Hewitt Fairburn, the creator of the foundation of all military combat, all modern military combat methods. Uh, I'm going to do this to fight the evil known as Will Marsistet. You will not understand this word, but it does actually represent the hidden evil in the world. Okay? We don't do that now. Leviathan. Hindus and Argentines. You are the mouth of hell, the hell mouth. And I ask that you open your mouth. Your mouth is itself the gates of hell. Leviathan, open the gates. Open your mouth, the hell mouth. Leviathan opens its mouth. The gateway to hell is open. Saint Peter. You were once a man, but you ascended. And you sit atop the gates of heaven. And I ask that you open the gates. Open the gate we're here and now. Open the gates of heaven. Saint Peter opens the gates. The gates of heaven are open. I summon through the gate where Benny Hill, comedian. Benny Hill, comedian and actor, step through the gates. Step through the gateway to this world. Benny Hill steps through the gates and is here with us now. I now summon the most banned individual of all time, the comedian, singer, actor and musician, George Formby. George Formby, come through the gates. George Formby, come through the gateway and be here with me. George Formby, come through the gates and stay with me. I now summon Edward Teach, he known as Blackbeard the Pirate. Blackbeard the Pirate, step through the gates. Edward Teach, he known as Blackbeard, step through the gateway and be here with me. Blackbeard, step through the gates. Edward Teach, is here with me. I now summon William Eve, William Ewitt Fairburn, he known as W. E. Fairburn. Creator of Defendu and the foundation, all foundations of modern military combat. W. E. Fairburn steps through the gates, steps through the gates and be here with me. William E. Fairburn steps through the gates and is here with me. Benny Hill. I ask that you use your talents to attack Wilmar Sistet, attack the evil. And this is why I ask of you, Benny Hill agrees to help and departs back through the gateway. George Formby, most banned individual of all time, the most censored. I ask that you attack Wilmar Sistet. Use your skills and talents to attack Wilmar Sistet. And this is why I ask of you. George Formby agrees to help and departs back through the gateway. Edward Teach, he knows Blackbeard. I ask that you attack Wilmar Sistet. Use your vicious talents to attack them. And this is what I ask of you. Edward Teach, he known as Blackbeard, agrees to help and departs back through the gateway. W.E. Fairburn, he known as William Ewitt Fairburn. He who created the foundation of all modern military combat. I ask that you use your skills to attack Wilmar Sistet. Attack them, and this is what I ask of you. W.E. Fairburn agrees to help the parts back to the gateway. St. Peter. Close the gates of heaven here and now. St. Peter, close the gates. St. Peter, close the gates of heaven. The gates of heaven are shut. Leviathan, your mouth is the hell mouth, the gates of hell. And I ask that you shut the gates. Shut the gates of hell here and now. The gates of hell are shut. So it is and will be. Out in the midday, out in the midday, out in the midday, out in the midday, son. Well, we are back. That was not exactly what I expected. That was a fairly straightforward ritual. And you had music playing back on. Did I see that correctly? Hear that correctly? That's right. The music was uh, Mad Dogs and Englishmen. Because I thought, 
I thought, you know, all four of these characters are eccentric in their own way. Because nobody really reaches that level without a certain amount of eccentricity. And I thought, you know, for proud, some would argue five, for proud British eccentrics, I thought, you know, the song Mad Dogs and Englishmen is somehow very apt. That's what I thought. Sure, sure. That, uh, that was no Coward. Yeah, it was actually... That version is sung by somebody else, but yeah, the song's no coward, yeah. I, it's a song that made him famous, actually. How fun, how fun. Well, and I think one of the things that you demonstrate in these riffs, which I agree with completely, is a lot of people, when they approach the idea of ritual magic, they, they tend to look at it as being very grandiose and very stuffy. Uh, and you demonstrate other modes, other vibrations that can be brought into this. It doesn't all have to be dark and and formal and uh, with candles and robes and yeah. and brand phrases. Uh, you, you had a Noel Coward song playing in the background, and your attitude was very upbeat. The language was simple. Uh, it, was, it was very light as far as the ritual goes. And uh, it still works. Yeah, to be honest, I think a lot of that comes from uh, when I started to depart from the stand up, what was the standard way of doing things. It was like it was about after my 15th book. And basically, I would experiment with trying different methods and inventing different methods. And I came up with that general method I use of opening and closing the gateways. And to be honest, I think that is the uh, the biggest piece of luck I had was inventing that because I could have invented it very differently. I could have twisted it and done it a different way because as it is, as, as you know, so it's very practical. You can put it on video, you can put it on podcast, you can perform it on your own, you can perform it with people, you can add things to it, you can do things away. People, you know, so it's it's great. It's also having a cultural effect. It's sort of people are using ideas from it in in other media and other things. And to be honest, it could have went any way. I could have, uh, you know, done that thing differently. And I think I would have went down the same path as some as everybody else did. But I was lucky there for some reason. I thought no, it has to go this way. And because of that, it opened up everything else. And I'm not naturally a guy who's always serious. So I feel that it's perfectly okay for a ritual to not be serious. But it all flows from that. It would have been difficult to do that if I had went and recreated a different sort of thing, which was all about candles and this and hoods. It would have been tricky to do that. You know, there was, yeah, I invented it, but there was a bit of luck there as well. I could have went the other way. And, you know, that avenue would just wouldn't have been opened up. But, yeah, you're right. You know, there's many different uh, things, you know, we can use and ways. But, you know, we're not just dark, we're light as well, and we're humour. And we can use that in occultism as much as anything else. Well, and it makes sense to me that in reflections of the universe in many ways, that the universe would respond to joy and humour as well as we would. Yeah. yeah, that's right. But it's also, of course, doing this as well. Doing this with you... Uh, let me look at things differently because suddenly, you know, I've got someone to bounce off, you know, and so you start creating things. You think, wait a minute, I can do this on the on the show and things like this. So part of this is about, you know, the environment as well that I'm in. I tend to embrace other disciplines, reach out occultism to new sure. people, and it it helps you to do new things and new ways. But yeah, I mean, you know, just because Benny Hill was a comedian doesn't mean he doesn't have power. You know, the truth is, he's a really, he was a really funny guy. A really funny guy. And I've always believed that sometimes, if you want to stop wars or you want to stop terrible problems, what you need to do is to send your comedians out there instead of your bombs or your armies, you know. The comedians can sort it out. They'll, they'll come up with something amongst themselves. And because it's a social thing, people will come to understand each other better. Certainly. Well, and humor is incredibly powerful. Uh, when we when we are able to laugh at something, it removes its ability to harm us, uh, at least emotionally. Uh, I mean, when you look at a lot of the the conflicts in the modern media age, yeah. going from the yeah. 
the turn of the 20th century, but I think if we even went uh, back to, what should we call it, the war between the great powers uh, that resulted in the I-8s? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, uh, what, yeah. What we call our revolution, and I think you still call our, our treason act, um, humor was, was very much a part of it, and, and that ability to to make light of your enemy and to to make them ridiculous so that it, it was easier to face them. That's always been a part of, uh, of warfare. And now that we've moved into sort of a social context yeah. for all of that, I mean, it's fascinating to watch the, the way that the comedy uh, goes back and forth with uh, politicians in the United States right now. There seems to be a, an intense sensitivity to that on the part of politicians, uh, having people yeah. laugh at them. And I was now they're at their most ridiculous. And our ability to laugh at what is happening keeps from press about it. Uh, I, I find that, that with all of the craziness going on socially right now, that I need to see how ridiculous everything is so I don't take it too seriously. Yeah. I also feel as well, though, that a lot of comedy has a political element to it anyway, because for comedy to really touch people, it has to be about uh, things that people understand, but also part of their lives, you know. People don't seem to do comedy about things that people uh, aren't really a part of in some way. So when you're doing comedy, you really, normally, they seem to be talking about uh, the world people live in. So it's bound to be political when you think about it, even if they're not trying to be, you know. It's sort of a critique on the world, isn't it? Well, if you if you study the ideas of writing comedy, two of the primary concepts about successful comedy is, as you said, it has to relate. But that also indicates that it has to have an underlying truth yeah. to it. Comedy doesn't work if it's about something that has no truth to it at all. It's it's not funny. Uh, but when you when you look at sort of the underlying truth to it and the relevance, that's where the comedy comes in. That recognition, uh, that 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 connection between your individual reality and what is being shown in the comedy, that is uh, that's what makes you laugh. Uh, and uh, I I think about Robert Heinlein, a fiction author, wrote uh, one of my favorite books called A Stranger in a Strange Land. Are you familiar with that book? You would enjoy it. It's a bizarre book. But there is uh, there is a scene in there where Michael Valentine, uh, our our lead character in the book, uh, he was raised on Mars uh, by Martians, and he's come back to Earth, and he. Um, He's not normal. Uh, he's very alien, and everyone is very confused about him. And one of the things about him that's odd is that he doesn't laugh. He doesn't recognize humor at all. Everything is is taken at face value. And there is a scene where we go through a big transition for him, spoiler alert, uh, where they're at a zoo, and he sees some monkeys uh, in the zoo, and he... Uh, Something happens with one monkey, uh, and so the monkey uh, gets upset and goes over to a third monkey that isn't in, even involved in the in this at all, and kind of pounds on him. And Michael begins to laugh, uh, and and he just he laughs hysterically. Uh, it's just as though years of laughter is all coming out at once. And uh, the the lady with him is, is very alarmed because he, he it feels like it's too intense. And uh, finally, he calms himself down and he says, "I know why we laugh. Uh, we laugh because it hurts." And what a what a profound observation! Uh, it, it is laughter is our way of of grounding pain, yeah. and we buy humor to the things most painful to us, it helps make them survivable, it helps make them durable, and it, it allows us to face them and overcome them. Yeah, that's true. I mean, a lot, a lot of comedians in the UK say that when there's recessions, it's much easier to make people laugh, you know. <laughs> you know, it's, for them, if there's a really good recession, you know, and people are really down, it actually helps. 
helps it for them because it's really easy then for people to laugh where when things are, are going really well you know it's difficult to make people laugh so it's sort of you know, the opposite of, of where things are for most people but yeah you're very true but i think this is a lesson to those in our audience that are exploring their own practice uh that when you try and face something down as something that feels bigger than you, instead of trying to invoke your righteous anger and draw all of your power and strength to strike them down, to smite them, might, to smite them mightily, uh, then uh, perhaps what you need to do is to invoke your, your righteous ridicule and to, and to, to use that energy to reduce the problem to its true size. Yeah. And then you may not have to eliminate it because it's so small that it doesn't matter. Yeah. And we're going to name that Benny Hilling their arse. That's what we're going to say. We're going to say, I Benny Hill their arse. I like it. Because that's a phrase now. I like it. That is now a phrase. I like that's it. we're going to stick with. Yeah, you'd probably say Benny Hill, they are ass. I'll say with us. My goodness, can you imagine yeah. what will happen when Rowan Atkins be Atkinson becomes available? Exactly, yeah, we could just add another one on. Oh, my goodness. Rowan Atkinson would be a, a terrible force to bring upon people. Uh, I wish him long life and great prosperity, but uh, my goodness, uh, what, a, what a powerful force to be able to invoke. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Or unless Mr. Bean on the world. Oh, my goodness. My goodness. Um, well, uh, thank you for sharing this. I understand that there is there's a purpose underneath this that is not obvious. And I won't ask you to discuss that. Uh, but but there, there are things hidden within this invocation that, uh, that define its true purpose. And uh, uh, this is an interesting experiment to see if... Um, to see if we can use this sort of power to make real change for the greater good. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to ask you to reveal any more about that. Those who uh, who understand such things will find it. Uh, but uh, I I'm very interested to see how this goes uh, because we need it. We absolutely need it. Okay. Thanks a lot. This segment had some of the strange time anomalies that we have experienced before. At times, S. Rob and Saul seem to be speaking in separate planes. Rather than trying to hide these phenomena, World Magic Movement has chosen to let you experience the times when we seem to thin the barriers between the worlds, so you can recognize when they happen to you. Regular listeners are almost certain to have similar experiences. My name is S. Rob, and I'm talking to Sol Ravencraft. Hello, S. Rob. Hello, Sol. And I thought we would talk about mermaids. mermaids. Well, I, uh, I certainly have a little bit of contact with mermaids on a regular basis. We have, uh, we have three Fiji mermaids on display at the Museum of the Weird in Austin, Texas. Three? Uh, one of them is, three, uh, yeah. is a smaller one. That's a lot. Uh, I guess maybe about 12 inches tall. Uh, yeah, like a like, like a mer child. Uh, well, it's it's uh, it's there on display next to the wax figure of P.T. Barnum, which is appropriate. He was the one who introduced the Fiji mermaid to the world, uh, and this one is very similar to the one that he originally displayed. It was not as large as people expect. Uh, it was actually fairly small, and it it is one of those interesting things. Uh, people. When they talk about Barnum, there's a lot of things that have come into people's popular, and so he he did do yeah, hoaxes on, that's and funny, he did you know, crazy I mean, things in his museum. That's um, education, the isn't it? Museum in New York City was five stories of uh, bizarre artifacts from around the world. At one point, uh, it boasted 800,000 artifacts, uh, including a living whale in the basement. Uh, and they struggled with that at first because they didn't realize that whales needed salt water. Uh, but they figured that out, and they, uh, they worked out an irrigation pipe from the oh, bay yeah. it, you know, water yeah. for the whale. And admittedly, it was probably not uh, a giant whale. It was 
going to be something smaller. There's all different kinds of whales. And yeah. it was probably not Because if we did that now, there'd be legislation brought in, you know. Yeah, this people, is in the middle 1800s. The person scanned about man eating the wood, yeah. To people, and it, it enlightened them. But in his museum, one of the, the, the jokes he would play is uh, would, yeah, he would, these it, ornate signs. It would go crazy. It would, it would just go, a great he would, it would just go crazy. Uh, and uh, you yeah, would follow would, the signs they would lose these the twists plot. and turns in the museum and finally through a curtain and and uh, uh, with with another big sign saying the great egress, you would go through the door and you would find yourself locked in the alley. And if you wanted to go back in the museum, you had to buy another ticket. <laughs> because egress means exit. Yeah. I was just wondering... Does, if, if, if a really fat woman was a mermaid, would she have the lower body of a whale? Well, uh, um, you know, possibly, possibly. I mean, is there a weight requirement? I'm just thinking, was, you know, is there a weight requirement here? But you know? uh, uh, Barnum, my understanding is Barnum did not invent this. He didn't go into his laboratory and say, what, what can I do to the public? He actually discovered these on the Fiji Islands, where the islanders created them as part of their religious practice. Uh, so while it wasn't a thing, it was a thing. You know, Barnum didn't invent it, he just discovered it. And uh, I think the initial one he showed was uh, actually brought from the Fiji Islands, and then uh, others began to create their own, uh, their own in the same style. Um, and th there, is, there is question as to why this is the case. Uh, did did mermaids in that form exist at one time, and then when they died out or went away or whatever, the islanders began to sort of recreate them uh, as homage? Yeah. Well, the interesting thing is the first ones were Japanese, but that's what I was thinking. Because have you ever heard about uh, dolphins that are deformed having, like, legs? No, I've not. I have because you get deformed ones and they have like a leg, legs on, uh, the, uh, there in place of flippers. And I was thinking, I thought, all you'd really need is like an aquatic ape, which some people said we were aquatic apes at one point. But if we'd done that long enough and we became, say, a, like a dolphin, we went along that line, all that would have needed to happen is for a few blocked genes to be unblocked, which happens sometimes through random mutation, and you've got yourself there a mermaid or a merman. So when you think about it, all you need is some form of ape that's became aquatic, and then it would either be in that form, or some of the blocker genes aren't there, and what you've got is a mermaid or a merman, you know? Because you think about it, yeah, well, if the yeah, dolphin would I, do I've that. I've certainly heard, yeah. heard stories like that, and there's a lot of rationalization. One of the popular rationalizations for the legends of mermaids is that would uh, would be out at sea and they would see uh, uh, say um, uh, 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 a sea cow uh, sunning itself or something like that and those poor lonely sailors looking at a distance their imaginations would reshape this this beast into some sort of uh, comely female fish sort of a thing but I mean can you imagine yourself being drunk enough that you look at, at a sea cow and it would appear to you to be a beautiful woman? I, I, there's not enough liquor in the world for that for me. No, really not. <laughs> the thing is that, yeah, no. <laughs> well, the thing is that isn't actually what happens is because people then don't talk about what did happen on board ship. And basically, it wasn't the fish they were looking at. There they were on board a ship with no women. But there is plenty of men. That's what actually went on. And some people say it still goes on in various navies and things like this. So, you know, the idea that they'll be looking for fish, not really, because there's humans still on board. You know, it's, like it's, sort of, it's supposed to be like a jail situation. You know, <laughs> just so... But I mean, it's it's not it's not like you have to explain it. Anyway, I can understand if 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 you're out at sea and and uh, uh, well, I mean, there's there's no way that it makes sense. I mean, you don't have to you don't have to explain anything. <laughs>
uh, uh, there's reason why you have to make up a story about about a woman to explain anything that happened to you. It just doesn't make any sense. Uh, it, it's 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 a great it's a great kind of skeptical conversation closer. This is well, yeah, uh, this is big sea animals and people with imaginations and all that. But I guess the problem is 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 that explanation does not fit in with my human experience. I've never had anybody say, uh, "Tell me a story even close yeah. to that." Exactly. Well, there is a lot of sightings as well, because I've got some sightings here. There's a one, this is an old one, in 1826, in Aberystwyth, uh, where a bathing mermaid was seen near the, the cliffs that are near the town. There's another one in the Outer Hebrides, this is an old one, uh, pre-20th century, that is, where a guy called Colin Campbell, who was a crofter, uh, which they collected like the the stuff to make roofs and stuff thing and, and houses out of and stuff. I won't go into all that, uh, like turf and things. But anyway, basically he was going to shoot uh, what he thought was an otter about the, to uh, eat a fish. And then he luckily realised it was a mermaid holding a child. And that was a pre-20th century one. An interesting one, I think, is this, was in the mid-20th century. So we're only talking about 1950s or something like that, yeah? And there was a, a sighting of a seven-foot mer creature. So we can't see if this one is a man or a woman, you know, a mer man or a mer woman. But it was seven foot, this creature. And it was seen bathing on the rocks of uh, Kill Rock Burn. And the Highlands, Craigmore is actually. Uh, and that was in, like I said, the mid-20th century. But it was seven foot. And that's an interesting thing. We always tend to think, oh, they're very like us, that there must be... You know, roughly our height, but seven foot is quite a height, isn't it? You know, yeah, that's quite tall, you know. Uh, and there's another one about the mermaid's curse, which is an old one, very old, like a folklore one, uh, where a mistress in a castle orders the destruction of a black rock so that a mermaid can't sit on it. The mermaid does not take well to this and curses them, and they all die without uh, be having an heir to the estate. And there's an interesting one about the seal people called the Selkie. Now, these are slightly different because these were uh, basically like a seal in the water, but a person on land. But the interesting thing is, there was supposed to be, or still is, an entire colony of these Selkies, or seal people, in Loch Dewich, uh, in the Highlands, somewhere. Uh, the water at the Loch, the waters of the Loch, uh, Loch Dewich is where they are. And there's supposed to be an entire colony of them. But there's also been sightings of mermaids and also of sea serpents in this place. So this there's supposed to be an entire colony underwater of these seal people. And that also leads me on to, uh, I'm trying to think of the name now, Melusine. Now Melusine is a French deity. But her lower body was thought of as looking like a fish or a dragon. So we've got to be open to the possibility that when people say, oh, it's a mermaid or a merman, that below the body it is a fish. It's probably just fish-like because, you know, a lot of these things seem to link in, certainly the deities seem to link in also with dragons and things like that. So we could be looking at anything or certainly something which isn't necessarily the classic mermaid, you know. Uh, and I know off some of the islands off England, uh, the sightings they have is of the men being green all over and the women being female above the waist but the mermen being all green and all over the all over the bodies and there's uh, some of the sightings above scotland tend to show mermaids or mermen with brown skin which is odd really because the ones off africa they seem to see mermaids with white skin so or clearly this is not a thing of inbreeding between people and fish which isn't possible anyway you know it would be like trying to play you know uh beethoven's fifth on a on a banjo you know what i mean on a g banjo this is not going to work but clearly there's uh you've got different types or different races but it's nothing to do link with us it's it's a completely separate thing you know if they exist in that form but it does seem interesting to me though the idea that uh, that, like I said, 
that the dolphins sometimes have legs. And I thought if a dolphin can have legs, if you had something that was once an ape-like creature, that could have arms. You know, that's what I was thinking. So, but who knows, you know. Well, and you still have odd things like um, there's the uh, the thirteenth mermaid bones uh, in uh, in a Japanese temple yeah. uh, that they claim washed up on the floor on the floor, on the beach uh, in the thirteenth century and were buried as a uh, as a sacred object uh, and uh, later uh, began to be displayed. Uh, uh, just the, the the mermaid concept it pervades not just our culture uh, but but all cultures uh throughout the world going it does, far yeah. back it's it's an old story it's an old connection um and some people even relate to concepts like atlantis yeah uh, that that the fall of atlantis yeah. uh, may have had something to do with the creation of of the Mer legend, uh, but it again, it's, it's one of those things that fits into this area that just seems to be important to being human. There are concepts like ghosts and and various kinds of monsters yeah. and and other ideas about what we think of as the paranormal and the supernatural that just need to be part of human thought and if we if we can't have it in one form we create it in a different form right uh, yeah uh, if you can't if you can't have superpowers as part of your culture then you put them in comic books yeah, yeah. right I mean it, and yeah the, and and this concept of uh, intelligence under the ocean and and a form of almost humanity that is connected with the sea seems to be one of those things that needs to be part of the human variant. We have to have this idea. Yeah. And there's also a royal connection as well, because if you look at Melusine, uh, she is supposed to be the reason why, or one of the reasons why the European royalty are royal. Uh, and like I said, she was also described as a lower body being uh, that of a dragon, as well as that of a fish. The story goes which is probably cobbled together over several stories, but basically uh, that she had a, a husband. But her husband couldn't see her when she bathed. And once he did look in, they could see the blow of the body. She had the lower body of a fish, and so she had to leave. But all of the royal families and all the royal houses of Europe all claim descendants to Melusine. Uh, it's, and like I said, it's also... There's also the reptilian link as well. The lower body is also described as that of a dragon. So it depends how you see this. Now, if you look in Japan, it's the same thing. Their uh, royal family uh, claim descendants from a dragon. Now, but their dragons are under the water. So their dragons were not f just flying around. They always had some big kingdom under the water, which is how they claim back. So basically, what you're talking is a situation where uh, all the royalties claimed that they were... Uh, royal, because they were part mermaid or part dragon, depends on how you look at it, which is, it, it, you know, and it, they still do, there's still organisations which claim, yes, this is because of this, and the strange thing is, if you find, I forget the name of the organisation, they're all a member of it, it's all the aristocracy that are a member of, of the organisations like this that claim that, so, you know, that is weird, maybe we should try throwing some water on the Queen, see what happens. <laughs> you know, just get a bucket. You, uh, you let me know how that goes. Yeah. I'll email you from prison if I do that. No, <laughs> no I won't do that, no. Uh, but it is interesting, isn't it, the idea that the royal connection, that they're all royal because they are mermaids. Right. Well, and I, I have to say that when we look at Trudeau's power, uh, back before we got into more of a, a social approach to that uh, with elections and, and that sort of thing, uh, that there is a certain sense in the idea that the people in charge would have connections to other realms, would have connections to others. Uh, I mean, 
it, it does make a, a weird sort of a sense. And I know we're off in fantasy land. There's nothing verifiable here. I mean, this is just imagination running free. But what in the world is your imagination for, uh, if not this? So to me, it makes sense that there is some sort of an intelligence. I mean, if, if we're gonna if we're gonna with the idea that Bigfoot and and that whole realm could be a form of humanity that stayed in the woods, that remained connected to nature in that way, and we're gonna go, we're gonna run with the idea that uh, that we started in the ocean and we evolved our way onto the land. Uh, then why couldn't there be? a form of humanity that stayed with the ocean. And either they've been able to hide themselves very cleverly, like Bigfoot might be doing, or they they died out. Yeah. I mean, there's certainly a lot of deities linked with the ocean and water. Uh, and these deities, it's always a matter of, you yeah. know, a case of this is our kingdom. It's not like other things where, oh, I am the god of the wind. But... You want a date is it's always like, no, this is our kingdom, we own this bit. And that is a distinct, different sort of matter with, oh, I am the wind, and I am the battle crow. It's like, no, we own that. And that is a weird thing about it, because you don't get that with uh, other deities. They just appear, they disappear, you know, uh, they're linked with this and that, the differing heights. But you don't get that sort of thing, that this is the bit that we own, and you only own the land. We own everything else, all the water. Sure. Well, and our command over the water is, is uh, not as even as great as our command over the land. Uh, there's a lot of water that we just don't know what about. And uh, our connection with it, uh, the, the, the amount of water that is populated by is, is minuscule as compared to what we've done with the land. Uh, maybe that will change at some point. I saw something the other day where someone is looking at a mode of building floating pyramid homes in the ocean, which uh, is interesting. It is, yeah. It is interesting, though, isn't the idea that, uh, that they own the water? Because in Britain, the Queen personally owns all the fishing rights, all... Uh, you know, of all of the water around uh, the United Kingdom. So, from from their logic, she owns that because of the mermaids. Because in actual fact, you know, she gets all of the money personally from all the fish caught. So, it's like a tax on it, basically. And anything that's caught, she gets that money, which is a hell of a lot, you know. Uh, and that's a peculiar thing as well. You know, the idea of owning water is something I always thought was strange. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> you say owning land, yeah, we're on land. And yeah. you say, but if you're on a ship, you're like a cork on an ocean. How can, you, how can a cork on an ocean own the ocean? You know, I always felt like, does anyone tell the ocean that you own the ocean, you know? It probably, it probably just thinks it owns itself, you know? Uh, and that's a sort of strange idea, but there seems to be a lot of connections there, isn't there, with the different sorts you know, there's not just one sort of mermaid, but the royal connection is interesting as well. It's sort of where that whole David Icke thing came from, you know, with the reptilians. Because some of them were called mermaids, but people also called them reptilians. And once you go there, you can sort of trace. But they tend to trace mostly uh, as partners. Most of the way, it's the same thing, you know. One's called a reptilian, one's called a mermaid, and it's that whole thing, it just seems to trace. Uh, right the way back, which is weird to an extent, although a lot of these deities seem to be many different types uh, and entities that go, that go back. But it's also the eye... Yeah. Well, and, and not all of the mermaid legends are nice. Uh, some of the mermaid look actually with things like sirens and yeah. such, creatures that would, uh, would actively lure people to their deaths, would try to call sailors to the rocks, would, would try to, to do harm. Yeah. They, 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 aren't, they weren't nice. Uh, they weren't things that you really wanted no. to encounter. They were, they were things that were, were going to hurt you. That actually reminds me of something. There was, uh, I think it was a few years ago, I was lucky enough to have a friend who had a, a, friend who had a boat, who had like a, a yacht or something. And 
I said they won't because they were both interested in the occult. I said it would be really interesting, you know, to do some sort of a ritual to like thin the border or open the gateway uh, on board a ship. Because I've always thought that part of the reason people saw mermaids and things like this is because it's easier to do that when you're traveling or when you're on water. Uh, I don't know if I told you that situation that uh, time a long time ago when I was driving. Actually, someone else was driving, and we were both thinking of something from you know the old Pirates of the Caribbean film, and it was I think it was uh, you know I were lost. Ah, oh, you've got to be lost to find the place that can't be found. Blah blah. blah. But we did it with intent, without really because we both knew what we were thinking, and suddenly there was all these cars whizzing backwards and forwards at an incredible rate. I mean, incredible rate. And then we went where we were going, and there was all these slot machines that didn't take new money. Now, my thought was, we did get back after that. When we came back, everything seemed normal. But I do think it's likely that for that point in time, there was some sort of a time slip. But I think if we had been on water and that had happened, I don't think it would have been a time slip. I think it would probably have been a dimensional slip. I think if that happened on water and we'd had it, we'd been on a ship... Uh, we would have probably have seen a mermaid or something like that. Or we might not have realised at all and just came back. But it's the idea that when you're on a ship, or, you know, on water, that because you're travelling and because you're on water, it's somehow different. But funny enough, when this guy did this, there was two people, and when they both did the ritual that I told them, it was on Skype, actually, they both said they couldn't see anything, but it looked different. Somehow it was different. The colours were somehow very slightly off to what it was before. So they did the ritual and they said, no, this does look, it doesn't look wildly different because they were in the water, they were in the ocean by this point. And they said, but it does look slightly different. There's a mist that wasn't there before and the, the colours are slightly off. And then they did the ritual and came back. But they were still talking over Skype with the time. So I think they were half between one realm and half between another because it was still getting through. And... Uh, but like I said, that was the interesting thing. There was a mist appeared. You know. And that's strange, isn't it? A mist appeared. The colours changed. But if they went all the way, what would have happened? If they went all the way, would they have seen a mermaid? Or some strange creature? And using the same method, they could have probably gotten back. I do believe. But I do think it happens by accident. Sure. Well, and, and again, one of the things that we we always have to keep in mind is the, the original contact. Uh, I think that people uh, who look at the country dimensions, multiple realities, uh, multiple planes of existence happening simultaneously, that where a, there is an earth – uh, where we crawled up out of the water and built skyscrapers, that there might also be an earth where we stayed in the water and developed an intelligent culture there. And that it makes perfect sense that if there are ever points where those planes get thin, where there's some sort of overlap uh, or connection, that maybe we do encounter that version of ourselves. Uh, that became the mer people instead of the land people. Yeah, and when we think about it as well, in the last 10 years there have been discoveries of different types of a ancient humans that we didn't know about, even just in the last 10 years. And when we also think, we really don't know much about the ocean. So it's still a possibility here. I know people say, oh, it's impossible. But if you think about it, there's bound to be types of ancient men that we didn't know about. Oh, yeah. We really only get the fossils of things that, that are fossilized. You know, if you're not somewhere near a volcano or something, you're not going to get fossilized. Uh, so it's just a matter of did the two come together? That's all it is, really. If we're talking about things, you know, in this realm, you know, is it a matter of what did they come together? Was there an ancient type of human that went into the water and stayed there, or was there not? You know. Uh, and if there was, was there a lot of them? There may not have been many. There may only be a very small, you know, population relative to us. It's quite possible. But like I said, the idea that they're in other realms and other places, I think, is basically, uh, in my mind, is pretty much a certainty. And you can't be certain really about anything. But it's pretty much a certainty because, you know, the sightings and, 
you know, there seems to be so many different realms, and it seems to, to some ways to be a more logical explanation, because like I said, the royals' families do, certainly in Europe, do claim descendants back to mermaids. Uh, and, you know, you, you, you can look that up and you'll find the society, and you'll find they're all a member. All the aristocracy are a member of this society. And you, and you think about it, we do tend to know something about our own family, even if we don't trace it back. You know, and aristocracy seem to be so interested in lineage, you know, in lineage, tracing it back, you know, whereas, you know, I'm less so, I'm not really interested in that so much, you know, although, although I do wonder, because actually, one of my ancestors uh, was on the bounty, and I always wondered, because, yeah, this is, but what happened was, obviously on the bounty, is that they became pirates, so I often thought, did he meet Blackbeard? You know, it was because I know somebody traced it back, and there was on the mother's side, and I think it, it was sort of like a uh, where they sort of uh, just get taken and you get made into a sailor or something. But either way, the the whole sort of ship revolted, and then they became pirates. And I thought, well, did he actually see Blackbeard? Because he could have done. You know, it's possible when you think about it. Yeah. Well, I think for me the, the ultimate takeaway, and this is what I try to express when people look at things like the Fiji mermaid at the museum, is to me this is, this is about wonder and imagination. Um, for me personally, it's obvious that there's something more than just mistaken identity or, or something like that. There is some sort of a reality connected with mer legend that goes back a long ways. Um, I would be surprised if there were more people still in existence in the way that we think of them in, in the water. That would be a pleasant surprise. It would be wonderful to find a mer kingdom and discover this whole other realm uh, of humanity uh, uh, that's, that's available. But I would say that the, one of the things that humans seem to be very good at is diminishing other populations. Uh, so whatever existence they had likely died out long, long ago and, and seeped into legend. Uh, but I, I do think it makes sense that there are several intelligent creatures from the past that sort of had to compete for survival and the, the, the walking ape version of humans were the ones that sort of won out. And the, uh, uh, the mer people, uh, there is a legend there, there is, there is a reality there somewhere, but I don't know that we'll ever really be able to put our finger on it. Because uh, I think one of the, the ways humanity survives we do is we, we tend to be a little Orwellian about things. Not only do we win, but what was before existed. Yeah, that's very, very true. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people think of your mermaid as a type of water fairy. Like, if a fairy was in the water, you know. Well, certainly, yeah. No, that's... there's there's definitely connections yeah. with that. But again, I, I can see that kind of thing uh, um, as as a, an almost dimensional kind of an existence. I think that what we think of yeah. as the Fey realms yeah. uh, is a place very, very close to us where the where the wall is the thinnest. That that it's it's a it's a, a parallel existence to ours. It is just very, very close uh, uh, and and I don't know if, if the wall is wearing down or thing up. Uh, but uh, but I think that a lot of those kinds of of things are, uh, are are things that are just very near our world, only get to peek in from time to time. Yeah, well, there is actually some proof uh, in that, really, because if you look back, there's an Irish folk tale, and uh, basically, is this guy walking home from the pub, and he's drunk, okay, he's drunk, and he sees a small handcart with a door in it. Now he opens the door and there's this big room and all the leprechauns and the fairies are dancing round. Now he looks on the other side and it doesn't go all the way through. Now the story is he talks to them and then he puts his head in. 
He doesn't take food off them because he, he knows better than that not to take food off the fairy folk. He does, however, nick a bloody big chalice and runs like hell. So he's gone, he's got his silver cup now and he is running and they're running after him. And it's said that it's, uh, it's you know, somewhere and p many people claim to have it. But the thing is, there was something where the scientist said, what would a fifth dimension be like? Because obviously we've got time. And he said, it'd be like a doorway. If you had a doorway somewhere, like on a wall, and on the other end of the wall there wasn't anything, but, you know, you had a closet in the wall where you had a, a cupboard where you could put things, that's what it would be like. Now, it seems that it's very unlikely that this very old Irish folk tale, that people would have been able to invent the idea of this other reality. Not necessarily, but that it seems unlikely they would be able to grasp the idea of... Uh, you know, of a fifth dimension, when the, the math for it didn't even exist back then. And if they did, they wouldn't have known it, you know, at, you know, at that point in time, at that location. So it seems more likely that's more or less what happened, that there was some other reality opened up, some other fifth dimension, from some fifth dimensional creature, and sure. that's basically what occurred. Maybe it wasn't a hand cart, maybe they didn't, the guy didn't steal a cup, but something like that where something that didn't make sense from our four-dimensional reality appeared and that's how we interpret it so that does seem to indicate that we're looking at something which uh which is real you know because it's a difficult thing to to produce you know the idea of a fifth dimension when you don't know it exists you know uh yeah so when you're looking at that you're looking at fairies and you've got like the two arthur de Danon, which were the ancient uh, fairy folk, the ancient kings and queens of Ireland that it is said became the fairy folk but you've also got the Fomorians that were there beforehand but interestingly the Tuatha de Danann came from somewhere now you think about we always assume some other country some other realm but who knows where it came from maybe they just came from the oceans you know it's anything's possible you know different sort of ways of looking at it because obviously there's still uh, so you still got sightings and things of mermaids around Ireland and different places, you know, as well as you still get uh, sightings apparently of the uh, leprechauns, although they don't share them as much, they reckon, with other people. You've got to sort of go into the pubs to talk to people to find out what they are, uh, you know, yeah, but they still, ha they still happen, you know. Uh, so that whole idea that, you know, other dimensions, and it does also seem in some way that it sort of makes sense. Because if you've got fairies and they're living on land, although most of the fairies oh, didn't absolutely. have wings, you know, it sort of makes sense that what they can do, that you'd have the equivalent in the oceans. And you've got to wonder if that's how their world works, where you wouldn't have, you know, their realm, you wouldn't have, like us and animals, everything would be a blend. So you've got like, you have, like, you know, we would be here, we're the humans, but they also have dog type humans and this type humans, and you know what I mean? And everything would be a bit human. In some way, you know, because then, yeah, because then the rules are different. Then you're probably not eating each other anymore. You're probably vegetarian, or you've got you don't really need to eat at all. You're just feeding off energy, you know. And who's to say energy is energy? You know, I suppose you can put different energies together, and then you've got a whole world where, where everything is part human and part not. And the strange thing is, we're at that point now where we could do that now with genetic engineering. You know, there is pigs that have a little bit of human DNA so that we can use their organs. So we're already there already where we have things or some things with human DNA in them. We could do that now. We could do that and say, OK, mermaids don't exist. We're going to make them exist. You know, maybe not exactly like we like the folklore says it looks, but something that has arms and our intelligence, you know, basically human body with the lower body of some sort of ocean going creature and you know we, we which maybe we cover the skid maybe with some sort of uh some sort of uh, uh scales and things like that and then we've got the mermaids and the mermen and then we'd say great now what we need now is maybe uh you know in cold climate right we need fur so we genetic engineer us to have fur and then we've got the bigfoot you know maybe need to be a little bit stronger you know Maybe bigger feet. You know, you could go on and on, you know. Well, and wouldn't it be interesting if uh, a lot of these legends are from a deep past, uh, the products of genetic engineering, 
where we created intelligent creatures uh, that eventually sort of run them up and ended up destroying the society of the day and turned into a bizarre world, uh, the world fairy tale land uh, along the lines of Tolkien or something like that, where these different races fought for their kingdoms and their viable, and then eventually uh, uh, the uh, the tool making monkeys won out again and started the whole cycle again, and we are now working our way toward creating uh, that multifaceted realm again. Yeah, that's the thing though. We always assume that we are the pure humans. This is how this is how we were for pure. But maybe we're not. Maybe we are just the blend of something with something else that caused this you know maybe there was you know some sort of strange creature which seemed to have very uh, you know very important traits that we have physical traits and the thought let's put these ones and we'll blend them with them and you know the ones that would have been in our position died off that we were the mongrels of some of the things that existed and maybe the other ones went but we stayed around because maybe we had a bit more strength or this, or you know, what we were hairier, or oh, something. No, we you know, have to be on top. the we gave us a bit of an advantage. <laughs> we have to be the gods. We can't. Uh, we can't be that. <laughs> so if you think about it, like the whole idea of uh, you know of making like a, yeah. a, a humanzy. Yeah. Sure. Sure. The humanzy idea, and when you think about it, if they had our intelligence, then you know they would have an advantage. I mean, if I would call being able to rip another person's Indeed. arm out of the socket an advantage, Indeed. you know, you know. I mean, okay, okay, the thumbs are a little bit different, but you could quite easily genetic engineering something with the thumbs right. I would imagine, and you know, and then some of the other makes sure it's got the human level intelligence, and then you know, we are in trouble. Well, and as always, uh, I don't know that I will ever know the truth. And I don't know that I ever need to know the truth about that sort of thing. I'm still just fascinated by the stories and the ideas. And I think that is what is the greatest value from all things. Very true. My name's S. Rob, and I've been talking to Sol Ravencroft. Thank you, S. Rob. This has been the World Magic Movement with S. Rob, Sol Ravencroft, Freddie Valentine. Production designed by Myth Made Productions. Produced by S. Rob. Music, A Dark Blue Arc by Pipe Choir. Find them at freemusicarchive.org. This program is licensed for sharing under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 4.0 International. For more details about usage and sharing, see links in the program description or visit creativecommons.org. This program is licensed by Werevamp Media Limited. See program description for additional links to guest sites and supporting information.